Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service, with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news, seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. You're listening to the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. Hello, I'm Oliver Conway. This edition is published in the early hours of Wednesday the 13th of December. The UN votes for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza as President Biden criticises Israel's military operation there. So will it make any difference? The Ukrainian president gets a warm reception at the White House but struggles to win over Republicans. And delegates at the UN Climate Summit in Dubai are still trying to reach a deal on curbing fossil fuels. Now the expectation is much higher, which is we want phase out of fossil fuels to be in the main text. But it always comes down to all night negotiation. Also in the podcast. I don't want to put a hierarchy between pets and children, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone said, like, I can't afford to have a kid, so I am choosing pets. With one of the world's lowest birth rates, are animals replacing children in Taiwan? Nearly seven weeks since it began its ground invasion of Gaza, Israel shows no sign of completing its mission to defeat Hamas. The Hamas-run health ministry there says 50,000 people have been wounded, on top of the 18,000 killed. For its part, Israel said on Tuesday that 19 of the 135 hostages still being held in Gaza are dead, and it had recovered two bodies. The UN General Assembly, meanwhile, has once again called for the fighting to stop, overwhelmingly passing a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire. The result of the vote is as follows. 153 in favour, 10 against, 23 abstentions. Draft resolution A-ES10-L27 has been adopted. Well, the United States voted against the non-binding resolution, but a few hours earlier, President Biden made his strongest criticism yet of what he called Israel's indiscriminate bombing of Gaza, saying the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu needed to change or risk losing global support, as I heard from our correspondent Barbara Platasha in Washington. He was speaking to a group of supporters at a campaign fundraiser, and the remarks are based on pool notes. We don't have the full transcript yet. So all of that being said, I think it's his most frank acknowledgement of the impact of Israel's military campaign. The phrase indiscriminate bombing is certainly stronger than anything we've heard from him. Also, the acknowledgement that Israel is losing international support, which we can see with those votes at the UN constantly trying to get a humanitarian ceasefire. But he in no way indicated that Israel was losing U.S. support for its military campaign. He did express differences with Israel, but that was over plans for Gaza's future. He said that Israel had the most conservative government in its history, that it did not support a two-state solution with the Palestinians, something that Mr. Biden's top officials have been promoting as the post-war path, and that Mr. Netanyahu needed to change the government in order to find a long-term solution to the Israeli Palestinian conflict. So that's really where he was the strongest in terms of articulating disagreements. And Mr. Netanyahu has commented also, he acknowledged the disagreement on Gaza's future, but he said Israel has U.S. support for its goal of destroying Hamas. Sure. Um, We have recently had more calls for restraint from the likes of the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. But at the same time, if the U.S. doesn't apply pressure by ending, say, diplomatic or military support, there don't seem to be any changes from the Israelis. So is this all hot air? I wouldn't call it hot air, no. I think that the officials who are making those statements, we're talking about Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State, who talked about a gap between intentions and reality when uh, speaking about pledges by Israeli authorities to spare civilians. You're talking about the Secretary of Defense, who have basically said if Israel continues killing so many people, it could be a strategic defeat because it will push Palestinians into the arms of Hamas. Those are real concerns. We are hearing them at the State Department. There is concern about the impact 
of the high death toll and the destruction of civilian infrastructure. But the U.S. policy-wise is supporting Israel's goal to destroy or to severely cripple Hamas. It's in line with the goal, and as such, it has called on Israel to protect civilians, but it has not pushed things publicly when civilians do not seem to be protected uh, in the way that it's calling for, and it continues to withhold support from a ceasefire, a humanitarian ceasefire, which is something that much of the world is calling for. Barbara Plett, Usher in Washington. Meanwhile, Palestinian officials say at least six people have been killed in the city of Jenin in the occupied West Bank during a military operation by Israel. The Israeli army said it had launched what it called a counter-terrorism operation there. Tensions have been rising in the West Bank because of the war in Gaza. Our Middle East correspondent Lucy Williamson sent this report from inside Jenin. Since the war in Gaza began... Israel's military operations in the occupied West Bank have become more frequent and more forceful. From the early hours of this morning, explosions and gunfire have echoed around Jenin, from the camp to the city centre to the hillsides around. Armoured vehicles have been moving around the city's main hospital near the entrance to the camp. Inside the hospital are the bodies of three of the men killed inside the city today, in a drone strike, witnesses say. I'm just walking up towards the hospital here where the Israeli army have positioned some of their bulldozers, just the drone overhead. You can smell the tear gas. Inside, I find the hospital director, Dr Wissam Bakr. The Israeli incursion that started about 4 a.m. Three young men came to our department. They are mostly civilian people. It's the second time in two weeks I've met Dr. Bakr here to talk about people killed during Israeli operations. The persistence of invasion and incursion to Jenin and killing the young people, this will make the people inside Jenin more angry. This will not bring the peace. Israel's defence minister said that hundreds of terrorists had been killed in the West Bank in the past year, more than half of them since the Hamas attacks. A youth leader for the West Bank's ruling party, Fatah, told me that support for Hamas among young people was now at an all-time high. Fresh idols for a new generation, he said, after decades of tightening occupation and fading political hope. Lucy Williamson in Janine in the West Bank. The Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, has been at the White House in Washington, meeting the man who is, in effect, his main weapon supplier. U.S. President Joe Biden is keen to continue helping Ukraine fight against the Russian invaders. But Republicans in the U.S. Congress are blocking Mr. Biden's latest request for $60 billion, on top of more than $100 billion already allocated. Republican Senator Eric Schmidt, who met President Zelensky earlier, said American voters would prefer the money to be spent on securing the U.S. border with Mexico. After the meeting, President Biden said he'd told Congress to approve funding for Ukraine before the Christmas break. This winter, Putin plans once again to bombard Ukraine's electric grid, plunging families in the darkness in the coldest part of the year and doing great damage. We can't and won't let him succeed. Mr. President, I called on Congress to do the right thing, to stand with Ukraine and to stand up for freedom. Well, for his part, Mr. Zelensky was keen to underline Ukraine's military gains on the battlefield. 600,000 incredibly brave Ukrainian sons and daughters are on the battlefield. They prove every day that Ukraine can win. And we are moving to the right direction and I want to discuss with the president how to strengthen it, especially enhancing our air defense and ability to destroy Russia's logistics. Our goals for 24th are clear. Take away Russia's superiority and disrupt their offensive. Well, our North America correspondent, Nomia Iqbal, told me more about the latest events in Washington. President Zelensky is on very comfortable territory right now. Both men have stood shoulder to shoulder saying that this aid is incredibly important for Ukraine. This package is needed in order to beat Vladimir Putin. Earlier today, it was much more difficult for President Zelensky because he was in Congress. We were on the Hill whilst he met all 100 senators, including, of course, the Republicans, to try and convince them. It's them he needs to get on board. And after that meeting, he spoke to a few of those Republican senators, including Lindsey Graham, including Eric Schmidt, who you mentioned just a moment ago. And they all said, look, in theory, we definitely support President Zelensky in his battle against Russia, but we want 
to prioritize U.S. border security. And they said that there's nothing that Zelensky has said to them so far that changes their minds. They're still not convinced the military strategy is a successful one. And they will not budge on what they're asking the Democrats in terms of security changes on the border. So this foreign policy issue has become a big domestic issue and there's just no changes so far as far as the Republicans are concerned. Yeah, given that, is there any suggestion that President Biden might perhaps give a little and accede to their demand? demands for more border security in return for getting some money for Ukraine. Well, right now in this conference, he's saying, look, we do care about what's happening on the border. And the statistics are there to show that it's not an issue that can be ignored. Earlier in this year, there was a daily average of 8,000 legal crossings across the border. And even members of Biden's own party have said that there needs to be some sort of change. What the new plans are, that's what they disagree on. Democrats say what Republicans are suggesting, a lot of their changes are unworkable, go against law, they're inhumane, they're cruel. So what they're exactly going to compromise on, we just don't know. President Biden is saying that he's hopeful that this big package will pass before Christmas. Mitch McConnell, very powerful Republican Senate minority leader, is saying the only way that this can pass is if Democrats agree to Republican demands, which they're just not going to. So it's really hard to see right now what the timeline is for any of this and what happens next. Nomia Iqbal in Washington. The UN Climate Summit was supposed to have wrapped up on Tuesday, but negotiations continued into the night in Dubai as the nearly 200 nations wrangled over the final agreement of COP28. The previous draft deal sparked uproar when it excluded any mention of phasing out fossil fuels, something widely seen as vital to reducing global warming. Mark Maslin, a British professor of climatology, says many countries do want an agreement that's tougher than ever before. The expectation is much higher, which is we want phase out of fossil fuels to be in the main text. We have had a huge sort of like excitement because the United Arab Emirates, the president have actually really built this up that they were going to have this in the text. But it always comes down to this, to all night negotiation. Well, delegates in the UAE have been negotiating over an update text, with the US envoy John Kerry saying it's likely to include tougher language on getting rid of fossil fuels. So are they making any headway? I asked our environment correspondent Matt McGrath, who is in Dubai. Yes, I think there are some signs of progress. I think the fact that the presidency is going around as we speak, meeting some of the country groups, explaining the changes in the text has made in the last day or so, I think it's hopeful that he is explaining to those country groups that their concerns have been met and he's trying to take on board and make a more progressive stab at an agreement than was the case yesterday. So I had a positive nod from John Kerry that things are somewhat stronger, but it's not a done deal as yet by a long way. Now, we heard that half of the countries involved wanted stronger language. What is the sticking point among those who don't want to hear this uh, phrase, phase out fossil fuels? It's quite complicated in some ways and quite simple in others. We tend in the media, I think, to kind of paint the cop into good guys and bad guys or countries who want to make progress quicker and other countries who don't. And on the question of fossil fuels, it's the petrostates who are seen as the ones who are not keen on going quickly. And that is certainly true. But there's another big bunch of countries in the middle, the emerging economies from all over Africa and Asia and South America, who are uncertain about phasing out fossil fuels because they need money and they see oil and gas as a major opportunity for them to make money to fund their transition to green energy and they're very cautious about giving that up when there's no money on the table in venues like this. And they need unanimity to get agreement. What might uh, a so-called landing zone, to use that horrible phrase, look like in terms of this deal? Hard to say how it will be anything other than a compromise. I hear from various people who have been familiar with some parts of the text that it's looking that way, like some form of fudge, if you like. That's normally the procedure here. You have 200 countries and getting agreement tends to fall towards the lowest common denominator. The big concerns for a lot of countries was that the science this year showed the warmest year in 125,000 years and it was a great opportunity to make the link to fossil fuels at a meeting like this and get progress on that issue and I think many people will feel it might be a missed opportunity but we might be judging too soon. There's still some time to run in this meeting and we haven't seen the text as yet. Matt McGrath in Dubai. Taiwan's birth rate is among the lowest in the world. The latest figures show that on average fewer than one baby is born for every woman. Many commentators blame economic factors for the trend, but as Ed Butler reports from a cat refuge in Taipei, 
pets seem to be filling the gap. OK, so I've just stepped into the quarantine section now. We're looking at a few of them gazing out uh, from their little pens. These are strays you just collected. Some were brought in by people who just saw them on the street. And some of them, they were adopted. We have more and more requests of owners who have to give away their cat. Who's this one? His name is Old He's very open when it comes to talking. <laughs> Aren't you? So you've got more cats than you used to have. Are more people coming in and adopting them? For sure, a lot of more people are coming in to adopt. Especially when they're young couples. So they're young couples, like people in their 20s? Mm, students. Yes, and students. Interesting. So these are their new babies. I think it, it is a lot like babies. Baby cats and baby dogs. Pet ownership, it seems, is skyrocketing in Taiwan at the moment, with furry friends now outnumbering the babies themselves. The writer and comedian Vicky Wang is one of the new generation of Taiwanese pet enthusiasts. I am an owner of four cats because it makes more sense in a city. You come home and there's someone there for you. It's it's comforting. I mean, I've seen... A lot of buggies, well, strollers, as you say in the States, and they are quite often not containing babies, but dogs. I think that's a uniquely Taiwanese thing because you're required to have them in a container to take them on the subway. It's like a wheelie suitcase. Taiwan, uh, I've read, has one of the lowest birth rates Mm -hmm. anywhere. Are pets replacing babies? I myself, I'm 37 years old this year doesn't really make sense for me to have kids anymore. It's a financial decision. It's like nearly impossible at the current Taiwanese salary to start a family in your 20s. I am pushing 40 now. I can't even consider it like buying property somewhere in Taipei, hopefully in a decent school district. That's completely out of the question if I stay here and earn a Taiwanese salary. I don't want to put a hierarchy between pets and children, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone said, like, I can't afford to have a kid, so I am choosing pets. Taiwanese comedian Vicky Wang ending that report by Ed Butler. Still to come on the Global News podcast. If they're sent back to Afghanistan, the Taliban will feel that they have been handed back some of their most fierce opponents. And the track record is they're either jailed or killed. The 200 special forces trained by the UK living in fear of being sent back to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Despite negotiations at the COP28 summit reaching a crescendo on Tuesday, the UK climate minister was called back to London on an 11,000 kilometre round trip in order to vote for a bill seen as vital for his boss, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. In the end, the controversial legislation on sending asylum seekers to Rwanda passed by a reasonably healthy majority of 44. Order. The eyes to the right, 313. The nose to the left, 269. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it unlocked. But divisions within Britain's governing Conservative Party are likely to reappear as the bill proceeds to the next stage of the legislative process. Watching events as they unfolded was our political correspondent Rob Watson in Westminster. It's just going to be a crisis delayed rather than diffused because the right wing of the party have said, look, in the new year, they're really going to want to make it even more draconian than many lawyers already think that it is. And of course, those in the centre of the governing Conservative Party have said, hang on a minute, if it gets any more hard line than this, we won't be able to support it. Yeah, yesterday we were talking about how it was, it was all reminiscent of the uh, Brexit negotiations. And in fact, we saw one of these groups come out today and make pronouncements just 
just as they did back in, what, 2018? Absolutely. They said they were not going to be supporting the government. Quite extraordinary if you think about it. And that they will not support it next year unless Mr Sunak agrees to make changes to it. It's absolutely an, an echo of Brexit because those on the populist right of the governing Conservative Party, the same people who are behind Brexit, for them, sovereignty is absolutely supreme. They think that Britain should be able to take back control of its borders, as they say. And the, the views of international courts or any sort of perception that, that sort of Britain is getting hard line, they're simply not bothered about that. Whereas those more on the centre of the party, although they now accept Brexit, they are hugely worried uh, about the way all of this looks to the outside world, about Britain's reputation as a sort of country that upholds international law, upholds domestic law, and which allows people, well, including asylum seekers, to access the protection of the court. Division is just crippling the Conservative Party in the way in which uh, discipline has broken down or is breaking down after 13 years in power. I mean, they have made it very clear, the centrists, that you know this bill is just about as much as they can stomach, because to briefly state what it does, it tries to restrict the ability of asylum seekers to seek uh, the protection of British courts to get their hearing in court. And for those on the, the centre of the Conservative Party, they think this, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens in other countries, not countries like Britain. Our political correspondent, Rob Watson, in Westminster. The BBC has learned that about 200 elite Afghan special forces, trained and funded by the UK, face imminent deportation back to their homeland, now controlled by their former enemy, the Taliban. The figures, gathered by a network of Afghan veterans, reveal the scale of what one former UK general called an absolute betrayal. The BBC's Joe Inwood has the story. This was the sound of Afghanistan's most respected special forces in action. They were called Commando Force 333, also known as the Triples. Their mission was to take on the Taliban. Ali spent nearly two decades in the unit. At first, we carried out thousands of operations to destroy the drug trade. Then, after 2007, when the Taliban networks gradually started their activities, we carried out operations against them whenever they were. Sir Richard Barons was deputy chief of the UK defence staff and knew them well. The triples were at the front end of the UK's supported counter-terrorism operation. They did the most dangerous, the most difficult, the most important missions accompanied by British soldiers and did many things that British soldiers didn't do. We speak to Ali on a video call from Pakistan. His life is very different now. He shows us around the tiny room where he has lived for nearly two years with his wife and children. The family arrived here shortly after the Afghan government collapsed in 2021. He assumed his work with the UK forces would mean he got help. But he was wrong. He applied to the Afghan Relocation Assistance Programme, Arab, but was told he was not eligible. I have been so disappointed. I served in different high-ranking positions and fulfilled my duties honestly. Despite that, a rap rejected my request twice. And he's not the only one. We've been told there are around 200 former members of the triples in Pakistan, either still waiting for help or rejected by the Arab scheme. The reason? They didn't work closely enough with the British. They were our allies. 18 years. But according to Lieutenant General Abdul Khalid, who set up the unit, that is just not true. We in Afghan and British government, we had one mission, fight insurgency. And donor for this mission, these triples, were Britain, British government. He says the triples were entirely funded by the UK, something backed up by multiple other sources. For Ali and the rest of the triples, the clock is ticking. Pakistan's government has started deporting Afghans who don't have visas. He told us that that could be a death sentence. We know of many former soldiers who were recognised and have disappeared, almost certainly killed. When Iran and Pakistan deport people, the Taliban have a list in our biometric data. Sir Richard Barons agrees. If they're sent back to Afghanistan, the Taliban will feel that they have been handed back some of their most fierce opponents. 
and the track record is they're either jailed or killed. The Arab scheme is managed by the Ministry of Defence. In a statement, they said each Arab application is assessed individually and in accordance with published policy. We do not automatically make a decision on eligibility based on a job role. They also said the UK government has brought around 24,600 Afghans to safety. Despite that, there is a fear that the treatment of people like Ali will do lasting damage to the UK's reputation. That report by Joe Inwood. A court in South Africa has ruled that President Cyril Ramaphosa's official crowning of the new Zulu king last year was unlawful and invalid. It follows a legal challenge by the king's half-brother, Prince Simakade, who says he is the rightful heir. Our Africa regional editor Richard Hamilton reports. When King Goodwill Zwelatini died in 2021, leaving six wives and at least 28 children, there was understandably some confusion over the succession. Under Zulu custom, the eldest son does not automatically become king and there have been vicious power struggles for the throne in the past. The court stressed that it was not determining who was the rightful king but whether the president had followed proper procedures before recognising King Misuzulu. The move is likely to plunge the Zulu royal family, already hit by claims of poisonings and killings, into further turmoil. The Zulu king does not have formal political power in South Africa and his role is largely ceremonial, but he does remain hugely influential with an annual budget of several million dollars. Richard Hamilton reporting. A BBC investigation has found that spy cameras disguised as household objects are still for sale on Amazon, despite the firm being sued in the US. The case has been brought by a woman who alleges that one of the gadgets was used to film her in the bathroom. More details from our technology reporter Chris Valance. One of the things I should say about the case in the US... This young woman, she was a foreign exchange student, a camera that resembled a clothes hook was placed in the bathroom of the place she was staying in and was used to film her. There's a gentleman who's awaiting trial for allegedly doing that. That camera, in its product listing, had a picture showing a towel hanging from the camera. And the lawyers, in their complaint, point out, well, what are towels used for? They're typically used for drying naked bodies. I've been looking through Amazon.co.uk and there are a lot of different varieties of cameras, including these ones that are designed to look like hooks that you hang clothes on. One of those showed the camera positioned above a bath, but there's one that resembles a clock and the seller has got an image of it being used to film a clothed couple on a bed. I saw a listing for one that was disguised as a smoke detector and it says It might be useful for monitoring an unfaithful partner. There was even a listing, a very rather odd listing, I've got to be clear about that, for a shower radio spy cam. So that was a camera disguised as a shower radio, and you have to wonder what would be the legitimate use for that. Amazon has declined to comment, but privacy experts say that people misusing their hidden cameras could be breaking laws in other countries. That was a site once thought to be too boring to excavate, but archaeologists in Italy have uncovered a once thriving town that could challenge assumptions of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Dr Alessandro Lornaro 